finds if she's still searching for nest maybe, but she usually it's usually when, uh, associated with feeding, and the male will follow her, and uh, he starts working. He starts strutting, showing off, and doing his his uh, his display and singing at her, um, and she mostly ignores him, uh, pretty much. And then once in a while, she'll decide, you know, she finds the right nest, she'll find the right male, and she'll she'll. Uh, reward him for his effort. <coughs> so here's a male that's working very hard to, to gain favor. And what's really cool about males is that they are very passionate about their females. They will guard them. So they, they find a valuable female, they will guard them uh, tooth and nail against other males and anything else. There's a great example where a woman was banding birds in Alabama, I think it was. She caught a male and female cowbird. She released the male first, and the male perched right next to the net and waited until the female got released. And then as soon as the female got released, he was just like, you know, uh, gonna protect against other males, you know, so he was so he was watching her, watching out for her, watching protecting his own interests, of course. Uh, so I think that's very interesting. So their, their behaviors are very fascinating. I also find their their song is some people don't like. Uh, I find it very basic. It's a, it's sort of this burbling, yeah. Uh, well, I'll, I'm not going to copy it because it's impossible. But this is what it sounds like. I'll play that again because it's important. It's also that's a display right there too to the female. So, sounds simple. Short, but let's slow it down. This is one of the most complex songs that I know. I mean, thrushes have beautiful voices. They do it. They do that over longer periods of time. So here's that same tone slowed down a lot. You're going to hear it again, and then we'll hear the same. We'll hear the tone. So it's really short. This is the searing of a bird. It's basically its vocal cords. Air comes down, it comes back out, and then the muscles in there in various places change and contract to let the air out. The air comes out at different pressures and, and all sorts of stuff. So you'll see the blue go down and come back out as a breath, and uh, um, part of a breath. And then when it goes back down, we'll listen here for the different sounds that are happening. This is, by the way, up in the top right, is what that song sounds like in a sonogram. So we're going to see these different sounds. That was the first sound that nobody probably heard. So that all happened in that little bit. So that is what the female is interpreting. That's what other males are interpreting. They're hearing all of that and judging it, uh, learning something from it. But it is not as simple as just a little bloop sound. What else about smarts, covered smarts? Well, females actually have one of the, have a larger hippocampus than males do, and that hippocampus of the brain is the area for memory. This makes sense. She has to remember where all of her eggs are. She has to remember where she found that red-eyed vireo nest. She has to remember, more or less, how many eggs she's laid in other egg nests all around the place. She has to refine these things. She has to closely monitor them, and she has to follow up. So she has an excellent memory. And my favorite example of how smart these guys is, is probably one of the reasons that they have become somewhat famous, uh, that why the species has become somewhat famous. And this is a, these are, people that I worked with in Southern Illinois, um, Jeff Hoover and Scott Robinson, who I worked with at the University of Illinois and then at, at the University of Florida. And this is a NOVA special. You know, things can get tough out there in the animal kingdom. Disagreements between species may arise. 
unpleasantries may occur. Sometimes steps must be taken to ensure the survival of the family. But our expectations have been exceeded by one particular animal who enforces his will in a manner heretofore seen only in humans. Correspondent Annalise Stratton has ventured into the swamps to track down a creature that may be giving its neighbors an offer that can't refuse. That's a female cowbird right there, that sounds. It may look peaceful, but these quiet cowfields might be a cut for a mob. You know the type from TV. Well, I'm making an offer again. Except this time, the goons aren't human. Jeff Boomer's on the case. We're on the trail of one of the most sophisticated crime schemes in the animal world. The suspect? The brown headed cowbird. If you've ever seen a cow, you've probably seen a cowbird. The males are black with brown heads, and the females are sort of drab gray. Until now, intelligence was never considered a trait because of a certain reputation. People describe them as lazy. Um, in general, people hate cowbirds. Why? Because cowbirds are free mothers. They never make nests or raise their own kids. They just ditch their eggs in other birds' nests. And let someone else do all the work. Just ask any bird watcher. The cowbird chicks are totally dominating the nest scene at the expense of the chicks that are supposed to be there. You know, it's, it's kind of sad to see a huge cowbird and you see this tiny little songbird just running back and forth all day long trying to feed it and the other chicks starve to them. In fact, cowbirds are so good at what they do, they appear to be driving several songbird species to extinction. But things weren't always this way. It all started in the Wild West. Cowboys used to roam with the buffalo and only really sneak eggs on species living close to open land. But now, with the bison gone and more man-made open land than ever before, we've invited cowboys into every last corner of the country, pushing dozens of already troubled species to the brink. It's a pretty serious problem. Without cowbird control, some of those populations, perhaps some of those species, would be extinct out. Gets worse. Cowbirds can somehow suffer over 150 different bird species to raise their offspring. How do they get away with this? Why don't the victims just throw those eggs out? That's where Jeff Hooper comes in. He's a bird ecologist with the Illinois Natural History Survey, and he thinks something in the story just doesn't add up. There she goes. She's go out. The longest time it's been thought that cowbirds are either dumb or lazy. And they figured, oh, all they do is they come and they lay their egg, and then they forget about it. They just ditch it. They just ditch it, and they never follow up. Case closed. That is, until Hoover started studying one of the cowbird's local hosts, the Prothonotary Warbler. We started seeing some really odd things happen. I would be watching a pair of warblers bringing food to a nest, and that nest contained a cowbird baby, and I'd happen to notice, oh, is that a female cowbird? Yeah, there's a female cowbird sitting maybe 50 feet away, kind of hidden, and watching. And then I just kind of wrote that off, and then I saw it again. Then Hoover stumbled on a surprising twist. It happened when he started removing cowbird eggs from warbler nests in an effort to increase the number of warbler offspring. And when we started doing that, we found that um, some of these nests were starting to have things happen to them. We'd see warbler eggs disappear, warbler eggs get broken. The usual suspects would be a raccoon, snakes, flying squirrels. But they weren't a problem before we started removing cowbird eggs. Trashing nests? Are we talking about revenge? We're in a little bit of denial because we didn't think that the cowards would be capable of this kind of sophisticated behavior. No one had really documented it before, and cowards have been studied a lot. We are talking about cowards here, aka lazy bums who pal around with cattle all day. Could cowards really be doing this? To find out, Hoover would need a scheme to catch these culprits red-handed, and he knows just the place to start. Welcome to Illinois Swamp Country, where 
Calvert's get away with dumping over 4,000 eggs on warmer parents every year. So where are we headed? We are headed to a site called X-Swap. Like X-Files X-Swap? Like X-Files. There aren't any aliens here, but it's got about 20 pairs of the warblers that we're studying. And there's also cowbirds here, so fit the bill for what we needed. The game plan. First, take out nesting sites across border territory. And maybe if I can take the poles from you. And this looks like a really good spot to put up one of our nest boxes. Right here? Right here. There. Okay. So we've got our two poles. Next, we'll line up hundreds of carbon copy nest boxes all over the swamp. So now we've got a nice little home here for the warbler. Right. And if we left it out like this, they probably wouldn't use it. So we need to make it looks it. a little suspicious. Yes. Like that. Yeah. We need to make them blend in a little bit better with the environment out here. <laughs> but how do you keep other critters like snakes and raccoons from butting in? So what's that? So this is axle grease. It keeps things like raccoons from being able to climb up and do anything ah, with the nest. This is like predator proofing. Exactly. This is really important for us to be able to eliminate yet another one of the possible suspects for who's ransacking our world of nests. So we set the scene and ruled out the usual suspects. But to pin any nest trashing on Calvert, we'll need to rule out the warblers too. They can be trashing their own nests for all we know. And that calls for a little custom modification to the housing. Oh, look at that. There we go. Perfect. Yeah. So this is the wide opening, the big opening, that both the warblers and the cowbirds can fit through. Okay. What we're going to do next is we're going to take a smaller drill bit, and the warblers, believe it or not, can still fit through that size of an opening. It's tiny. The female cowbirds are about three times the size of the warbler. Mm -hmm. They can't. Now we've got a covered free nest box. Nice, it's convertible. Exactly. So we start with a large opening because we want the cowbirds to come in and lay their eggs in the nests. And then we will remove cowbird eggs and put this insert in. And mm -hmm. if we put this insert in there, these nests should all be safe because cowbirds can't come in. The plan? First start all the boxes with big openings. That way cowbirds can get in and lay their eggs. Once the female warbler leaves, and it's go time for the female cowbird. Now the cowbird comes stealthily, flies in, lays her egg in about 10 seconds time, and blasts off, and then she's done. Then take the cowbird eggs out, and for half the boxes, put those inserts in. Now these nests should all be safe. The others still have big openings, so if they're the only ones to get ransacked, we'll know who done. Maybe one last step. Wait. Head out this way. Right. Okay. So, do you ever make a cowbird egg omelet? My guess is that it probably wouldn't taste too bad. <laughs> Especially with a little bit of Tabasco sauce on it. The stakeout begins. Dozens of nests. Day after day, the team slogs through the muck to check the status of the eggs. It takes months, but slowly a pattern begins to emerge. Only the nests with big openings are getting ransacked. And over a number of years, the patterns became really, really clear to us. That, you know, oh my goodness, we've actually got experimental evidence that female cowards are really doing this stuff. Sure enough, those small hole nests cowards couldn't fit into were 100% safe. It's the most compelling experimental evidence ever of an animal besides us exacting a mafia-like retaliation. My first reaction was to pull the wire there and waste my every time. And they even caught the whole thing on tape. With quick, sharp stabs, the female coward does the dirty deed. Within seconds, the entire warbler brood is destroyed. We didn't really nail it. But then, well, why would they destroy the contents of the nest? Um, what does that do for the coward? Perhaps it's a power play cowbirds use to force other species into accepting their offspring. Because the world is to learn, if you don't play along with this game, if you don't raise my offspring, there's a penalty. And that penalty is that we're going to come back and we're going to mess up your nest. We simply have to view this person as a much more sophisticated way of thought. That says some amazing things about alien intelligence. 
so maybe it's time to reconsider the Calvert's reputation. I think the word you want is exactly what we've done. Um, they come back and they, they monitor mess. They're actually seeing their offspring that being taken care of. What I really like about it is that it's the female Calvert's too. It's Tina Soprano instead of Tony Soprano in this case with the Calvert's. Nothing personal. It's just business. There's also thought that the, one of the reasons that they do this is simply because they can get the warbler in the nest again and create another nest. So then they're, you know, they're, they're hard to nail down that, what, what the explanation is there with their competing hypotheses for that. Okay, and lastly, of course, I've heard this quite often and it's kind of prevalent through all kinds of, of comments, is that um, this is a it's a bad way of doing business. It's, it's, it's cheating. It's a, it's, a, it's a cheap strategy. And oh, I, 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 you know, for one thing, it's, it's important to note that this, uh, there are lots of different kinds of avian bird parasites all over the world. Uh, this has evolved a number of different times in different lines. Cuckoos is a famous example of it. The cuckoo that actually makes the cuckoo noise of a cuckoo clock is a very, very good brood parasite. It specializes on a few species that um, this is the uh, cuckoo chick right here in the reed warbler nest. <laughs> so uh, that's a lot bigger bird than a cowbird is. Um, this happened in a, this uh, evolved in honey guides, which are in Africa. Uh, it's, there's a, a South American duck that's a, a brood parasite. Brood parasites are also known within other species. They'll lay in uh, in the same in, in nests of the same species. So they'll like a lot of ducks will go, like a uh, copper golden eye, for example, will lay its egg in another golden eye's nest. So that's another form of parasitism. And they don't raise those kids at all. So it happens more than you think. And it also has evolved in other groups of animals. So it's evolved, evolved in certain families and orders of insects and fish. Um, and I just wanted to point out that you know every single species on Earth in some way exploits another species negatively and hurts another species. So we've done, uh, we're, we're just, for, for some reason with this one, I think our, our species is very paternalistic and maternalistic. And this particular reproductive strategy rubs us the wrong way. Um, so just a, just a few kind of points that, that I want to reiterate. One is that cowbirds are way smarter than people ever gave them credit for. They're really quite brilliant. Uh, and they are not freeloaders. They are not lazy. They are working very, very hard. And this reproductive strategy that they've used has developed over many, many eons. And is an evolutionary strategy that, that works. Uh, and that has worked for a lot of different organisms, too. This is a, this, they've been doing this for literally tens of thousands of years. So uh, this is something that we, you know, humans had never complained about until we started paying attention to it. It's been going on for a long, 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 long time. And they haven't been vilified until 1800s, probably. So, and really, ultimately, the, the problems caused by cowbirds are a result of humans, human activity. Changes in habitat and creation of permanent being areas. So it's easy to blame the cowbird for its way of life and what it does, but ultimately it's something that we would have to address in order to create more forests that are that are less fragmented, um, reduce you know the places that they feed and eat. Um, but ultimately, I would I would also argue that this deserves this unbelievable organism deserves to be celebrated a lot more than it is vilified. That's my opinion. <laughs> and with that, I'll take any questions that you might have. Yeah. If you had an aviary and there were only cowbirds in it, would they not be able to reproduce? She, uh, she asked, if you had an aviary and there were only cowbirds in it, would they not be able to reproduce? That's a really fascinating question because I actually did this for my dissertation work. I had a, captured co a captive cowbird colony of wild-caught juveniles. I they, were, they were in a captive group. I had some that were uh, just with males and females together, and some I put with society finches. 
Um, the ones with society finches produced eggs. The ones that were just males and females produced one or two. So they, they really need a stimulus really, in order to produce the eggs. And I also used those eggs and threw them in a whole bunch of nests to test defensive behaviors after that. So I, was, I had to get a lot of permits. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Cowbird, no. As far as I know, they do not. They will beg from anything that comes by with food. And how do uh, they reproduce? How, the cowbird chicks? By recognizing other cowbirds. Like recognizing their species. That's in jet. That's hardwired. That's completely genetic. So they, they, you know, it doesn't matter what species raises them. And they've done some studies to, to, to try to figure out whether or not the host that raised them is a preferred species when they become reproductively active. And there hasn't been any data that show that, like, for example, if you're raised by a toby, boy, you really like to lay your eggs in toby nests or something like that. There's no data for that. But, yeah, they, they're, they're, they're hardwired to know how to, yeah, to, it's all genetic, basically. Is that my answer to your question? Yeah. Okay. Yes? So the males, that song is completely instinctive? It's not a learned song? It is, it is an, it is an, an instinctive learned song. Um, there's a critical period for song development where birds have to hear another male sing it and, um, and then they get it. But if they don't hear him sing, if they don't hear a male sing it, then they don't really quite know what to do. So bird song, the development of bird song is fantastically interesting. Um, and cowards are no exception. So they, they do need someone to teach it to them, basically. Um, and not directly, they just hear it and they're like, okay, that's, that's how I do it, okay, I've got it. Being raised by their parents, so how do they hear it? They hear it when they return the following year to the breeding sites. So they hear it when the ju juveniles will be out, and juvenile covered flocks will be out, big flocks. And uh, they typically will travel south, maybe Texas, uh, Oklahoma, huge roosting flocks. And then uh, they'll come back to more or less, really, close to where they were born. And um, and that's, that's where they, a lot of them learn their song. But then some of them, I'm not sure the timing of that. Some males might learn their song probably on their wintering grounds, too. Is that why you always see multiple males hanging out together early in the spring and only some of them are singing? I think, I don't know that to a fact, to a fact but they're very social. Uh, the males are very social. Actually, males and females are very social, particularly when they're in, uh, feeding together. Uh, they're all together, they work together, they're, they're not too aggressive to each other, they're very very gregarious. So uh, my sense is that they're, the, the probably dominant males are not really doing anything with the other ones, but the younger males are learning from them. Yes? Uh, can you explain the tracking program for cowbirds? And secondly, why does she have to remember where she puts the egg? Um, the first is that, and I'm not sure if I have a picture of this, I actually believe I do. Um, the traps are drop down, they're baited drop down traps. This is <laughs> sort of what one looks like. Yeah, I don't have a good example. <laughs> So everything with me is birds, so, you know. Um, yeah, it's a drop-down. I don't have a good photo of it, but um, this, this might give you some sense of it. It's a wire cage, uh, a large wire cage, and then the center of the trap, and some, somewhere in the center of the trap has a spot where the cowards can drop through an area that to close their wings and drop down into like either a, a crevice or through an area with wires that dangle down. And there's food down there. It's, they're, because they're, ter because they're um, social, they're typically baited with other cowbirds. And they'll go in there and they'll eat. And um, then you can get them out of the trap by shushing them into the smaller trap and do whatever you have to do with them, release them or not. Um, so the traps are very effective. They're, and they're actually designs for them online. 
You can make your own. And then uh, your second question was regarding why, why the pain needs to... Why remember where she puts these eggs? Because she wants to follow up. She wants to know, she's going to have her eggs out in a number of different nests from a number of different species all through her territory. She has to remember where those are so she can go back, for one, to lay more eggs in that nest, and two, to follow up to make sure that her, her kids are being raised properly hmm. by another mother. Hmm. So she wants to go back and, and watch them and watch and make sure things are going well. Well, if they're not going well, what does she do? If they're not going well, then she will exact her uh, penalty often. She will, if the, if the egg has been removed, for example, she might, dip, she might prey on the eggs that are there and force them to start over again. Uh, Coppers have also been known to remove nestlings to farm that nest so that the, the female host species will start over again and then she will find that nest and lay her egg right in. So she's, uh, she's quite smart. Without avoiding the human descriptors. Yes? Um, how long will the female cowbird hang around to watch the nest? Because I guess I, I always assumed that the uh, purpose of this breeding strategy was that they didn't have to stick around, that they could follow the buffalo herd and they didn't have to stay around very long. So, how long, are they, how long do they hang around to watch? The That's nest a great cowbirds? question. That'd be a good idea. That'd probably be a really good research study. I don't know. Um, I can't imagine it's too long because she's got so much work to do. Yeah. You know, she's, and she's got to eat too. And her metabolisms are incredibly fast. So she, she, yeah. I would just mention that a lot of these nests will hatch within a week, maybe a few extra days. Mm -hmm. And so when we say she hangs around until they're chicks, that's maybe five, seven, ten days. So it's right. not a long time that we're talking about. Well, thank you very much. I'm available for more questions, and uh, again, thanks for coming.